Welcome everyone to our weekly webinar where we're learning together about the latest real estate trends during the pandemic. With an increase in digitalization, Zillow and Compass going deeper into the transaction, Open Door and Zillow launching brokerages, the need to understand compliance software has never been greater. COVID-19 has drastically impacted the ability for in-person interactions, but can the transaction process adapt? We're hosting today an exceptional discussion dedicated to the topic of transaction data and software platforms with some of the top leaders in the real estate industry. Feel free as always to ask questions here on Zoom or social media. And in the end, as always, uh, stay online to see some of our latest product updates. We're joined today by two amazing ladies, Nina and Susie, my dear friends. Please uh, welcome and please share what is your role in the industry and what are you passionate about? Um, just a second. So we're going live right now. Uh, again, welcome everybody. Uh, to Proppy webinar. Today's topic is the software compliance uh, and we're joined by Nina and Susie. Uh, welcome. Uh, please share a little bit about yourself. After you, Susie, I'll let you, I'll let you shoot. <laughs> Uh, we're both we're both gentlemen and scholars. Um, my name is Susie Truax. I am a, an agent first and foremost um, at EXP Realty. I was actually the pioneer of EXP in the Bay Area. I'm also licensed in uh, California, Pennsylvania, Florida, New Jersey. I just finished up my almost three-year term as a board of directors with EXP World Holdings, which is the parent company of EXP Realty. And also I led the agent advisory council for EXP Realty. We're 37,000 agents under one umbrella internationally now, US and internationally. Um, and so I know how it feels to be on the business owner side of the table and also as an agent. So I know the pain points of um, both, both parties and um, yeah. Oh, and recently I just became the uh, program director for San Francisco Women's Council of Realtors. So that's who I Yay. am. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. So all things technology and all things, um, you know, moving forward and, and innovation in our industry. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Awesome. So uh, my name is Nina Desange. Uh, I am also a realtor. Uh, with the Nolan Group here at Vanguard Properties. I also serve as the Director of Strategic Alliances and Technology. And my background really is, you know, has always been in real estate. Um, I started in the real estate industry in my early 20s, um, working for uh, Title and Escrow. Um, and after doing that for about seven years, got my real estate license. Um, and so um, I've kind of seen also, just like you, Susie, uh, have seen the uh, transaction side of things and also uh, the management side of things, um, how the agent uh, perceives these products uh, in terms of their day-to-day -day business. So um, I also serve as the 2020 uh, Federal Technology Policy Chair for the National Association of Realtors and am the current past president of the San Francisco Association of Realtors and also the past president of Women's Council San Francisco. So I'm okay. so excited that they that they have you, Susie. That's so great. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, well, let's start uh, over the shoot to the topic. Uh, Susie, what kind of problems do you have today? Uh, with uh, the current uh, compliance tools and software uh, transaction management tools that we, that are broadly uh, known in the industry? Well, without naming names, Natalia, because that wouldn't be nice. Um, there's mainly three major transaction tools. Um, one is proprietary to a large company and that's their, you know, their in-house one. The other ones, um, I, I should name a little bit of names. Uh, I'll just say we at uh, EXP use Skyslope and that's pretty broadly understood in the market as, you know, transaction platform management. And um, for anybody out there who doesn't use it, it's basically a database where you upload, agents upload the documents and it has a back end for the brokers to look everything over. Um, 
and uh, and then the other one is dot loop. The problem, the problem, I guess, I as I see it as a you know a shareholder in my company is that I believe that dot loop was purchased by Zillow. So um, you know Zillow has has since gone into brokerage. So it would be odd to use another brokerage's um, platform. And so what, you know, I actually, for this, for this talk today, I talked to someone who does the compliance on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, we talked about that sometimes the software goes down. I, I personally feel as if, um, you know, the software, uh, the manual aspect of the software could be far more automated. It's, it really needs a, a user interface upgrade, but, you know, we're getting along with what we've had to use. Um, but there's still a lot of manual processes involved in all of this. And, um, you know, the, the user adoption thing is also kind of clunky. So those are, I have so many suggestions, but <laughs> yeah. I don't want to tell you all right now. <laughs> okay. We're open to suggestions for sure. Okay. Uh, Nina, one of the problems that I'm hearing from a number of broker owners is this concern uh, uh, about data sharing. Uh, so my question is, what do you think about data sharing when it comes to transactions? Uh, do industry participants worry on your opinion that transaction data may go to zero fidelity, compass, and the like? Sure. So, you know, if you ask me personally what I thought about data sharing just from my own personal uh, perspective, uh, I would say that, you know, I'm all for data sharing and for the ability to use data to make our lives easier and for uh, us to be able to leverage that to, um, you know, make the agent's lives easier. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, when we talk about data on a larger scale, uh, especially when you're talking about a massive amount of data, right? Agents are inputting this data, whether it's their consumer information or their transaction information, but all of that information is being gathered somewhere and it's being sold to somebody to be used or leveraged either for you or against you. And so I think that those are really personal choices that people have to make, but from a brokerage level, when you look at data, you obviously do not want to be working with a company that is selling your data and monopolizing on what you are contributing to that asset um, without any benefit for you to leverage back, which is one of the reasons why I love Proppy so much. Um, I think you guys really do give uh, the broker owners leverage uh, to their own personal data. Um, and I think that that's, you know, I think that more and more companies are going to have to look at uh, what that looks like for them. And they're going to have to ask themselves that question of, you know, am I working with a company that is uh, protecting my data and is, you know, showing me integrity of, you know, how they're protecting my, my data and not just mine, but the consumer data, right? Which is the more important aspect of this. So that's what I would say in terms of data. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And we need to really pay attention uh, what kind of culture uh, entrepreneurs have, broker owners or tech entrepreneurs like myself, uh, because I think the, the new successful company will be those who will have those policies on cancel uh, easily one service, uh, should be canceled easily, uh, should be uh, charged, uh, charged also transparently. Uh, they should not uh, do cross-selling uh, if there is no consent of the consumer or of the agent. And obviously, if they want to share the data, they should be open and front and better not to. If you sell the data, you collect and sell the data, you probably should consider to at least share this revenue with the originator of the data. And yesterday um, at Inman, there was a great talk uh, by Courtney, um, our uh, mutual friend, uh, Courtney Poulos from ACME and Veronica Figuera. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it. Figueroa. Figueroa, yeah. Uh, she's worked from EXP, so was probably your friend. So the conversation was about uh, uh, who is the evil in the story, Zillow collecting uh, data, collecting pictures and then selling it and now turning into a broker 
uh, or MLSs that are allowing uh, this data to be shared to companies like Zero. Uh, Susie, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, I wanted to go back to what Nina was saying about and what you were saying about the data. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's not going to go away. Collecting our data and monetizing isn't going to go away. For any, any broker owners in the audience or anyone considering open, their, open a brokerage, you have a monetizable asset and you shouldn't, to me, this is my business hat, right? As long as you um, have permission from the customer and the originator, right? The agent who's inputting the information, not to sell it to Home Depot to send out a coupon, but I'm thinking more that, you know, the, the, global, the global big data market in the, the industry is d almost doubling every few years as far as monetary value. And, it, and brokerages do have another asset that they should consider monetizing in a really ethical way. And so to me, I know that some of these companies that you're doing your transaction, the transaction platforms don't allow for um, the brokerage to monetize their own data. And so I would only partner with a company, you know, either having, and building an in-house transaction platform is, you know, that's kind of crazy, but only partner with a company that offers the ability to have the, you know, to have the ability to take your own data and monetize it. Uh, I think about the predictive analytics within that. And so that's why Zillow is so interested in it's gonna be able, they're gonna be able to, if they're able to have massive amounts of data, they're not only gonna be going direct to the seller, they're gonna start being able to make predictions on when people are selling and you know, selling that information, turn around and selling that to agents, right? There's a couple of companies that have sort of this, you know, Remind is one that comes to mind where you can make a prediction based on certain data points, life events, um, a, you know, how long the person has owned the home. But this is, Zillow is going to get into that and try to, you know, dominate, I think, dominate the market there. So hopefully that answer, answer your question. I don't think the data sharing is necessarily awful evil and every company is doing it. But I think as the broker owner, you should be monetizing your own data versus letting another company have that ability. Or, or request uh, the revenue to be shared. Absolutely, absolutely. So could I, could I add, add to that? Because I think that there is a common misconception uh, about uh, multiple listing services. And that misconception is, is that the multiple listing service sends the data to Zillow. And while that statement might be true in the sense of they physically do facilitate the data to get to Zillow, but the broker is the one that actually decides where that data goes. So when people say, you know, the MLS sends the data to Zillow, I want to be clear to say that you are in power of where your data goes. So if you're a broker and you don't want your data to go to Zillow or whatever, um, which was the case before, but now that Zillow is a brokerage, I think we are talking about a different scenario. Um, but, you know, this is really driven by the consumer. What does the consumer want? And what we've realized is that these platforms were able to come out faster with what the consumer wanted, right? Um, and when you talk about transaction automation, I think this is, it, it, it loops around to that same first initial question, which is, what is the consumer looking for? And if we're always asking ourselves from that perspective, all of the other tools and technology products that we are looking at, you know, adopting or utilizing, um, if they're driven from that perspective, and that's really what's driven Zillow, right? So, you know, first it was they allowed agents to input their own data. Now it was, no, we're only going to take the data from the MLS, right? Because they realized they had a data integrity problem. Right? They weren't able to keep up the, the, the data where the consumer was saying, hey, I'm going to Zillow and I'm looking at this listing that says active and it's not active. And it sold three weeks ago and the agent didn't come in and update the Zillow platform. So I think that you know, when you come from that question of like, what does the consumer want? We have a really big opportunity in transaction automation to be at the forefront of this whole thing. Everybody is in the race for the one all be all end to end, right, um, platform. And so I think, you know, that's, that, that really is the driving question. So, so that's really how I would kind of um, answer that question. Awesome, I love it. And uh, 
when it comes to the consumer user experience, and uh, we talk about uh, this question a lot with our customers and here in Silicon Valley with different Silicon Valley based startups, what do you think is the secret to find the most uh, user friendly uh, path uh, for consumers to close transactions online and to make this compliance easier? transaction compliance to be processed easy because as, as far as I sense uh, Nina you suggest that all the pl platforms that exist on the market including Propy, the winner will be the one uh, that will be able to address the consumer experience. Just have to make Go it ahead Susie. Make, <laughs> make, make it simple and easy to use. I mean you know the the, the consumer doesn't want to something complicated at all. In fact, you know, the reality is there are still some people who need paper signing for goodness sakes. Um, so make it, make it clean, make it simple, make it, uh, you know, for the millennial crowd, make it able to be used on the mobile. And, you know, th to me, that's, that's the best answer. Uh, it still has to have the compliance on the back end, and that can be however, you know, the builder wants it to be. But from the consumer side, it really has to be explanatory and easy and maybe also have, you know, I start to think about compliance things. Um, one of the things I don't like in the hot market is people are just signing contracts. They're getting stuff in DocuSign. They're not even reading it. I'd love to see, especially on the really, um, the really important like agency disclosure, dual agency disclosure. I'd like to see video. Am I, are we designing a new product together here, Natalia? I'd like, oh, to see, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see like a video. You must watch this. You cannot scroll past it. Um, yes. Initial yes. that you've done this, but it can be done. It's not going to be easy, but it should need to be simple for the consumer to use. Yeah, it's, it's like when you have 100 forms, disclosures on the whatnot, the consumer is so much lost, they don't know what to pay attention to. And so they're not even, they're not reading it. They're not even reading it. They relied on the agent and if we can hint them, hey, this one should be read, or this is the summary of this 20 uh, page long document, uh, the most critical things. Um, exactly. Yeah, I don't think Yeah, and I think Natalia, what you're really talking about here is, is transparency, right? For all of the parties. You are talking about transparency for the broker side of things on the back end compliance part. You're talking about transparency for the consumer and just, I think all around, right? It improves, you know, the accuracy of the data um, and you're able to, uh, you know, really know that you are providing um, all of the information to the consumer that is digestible. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we've all done it. You sit across the table and there's a stack of papers and, that, you know, title officer is explaining all of the closing information and people are just signing. They're just like, you know, um, and it's been proven even through uh, some of the research that the National Association of Realtors has done that consumers actually feel like they, um, they're getting more information on an e-closing platform because they're actually having to go through that step-by-step -step process, mm -hmm. which sometimes is, you know, is kind of just, put in a one hour timeline, right? You have 30 minutes for a signing and you know, you got to get through all of this, all of this stuff in 30 minutes. Um, so I think that this is really, it, it reduces the risk for all of us. It creates some more transparency and that's really all the consumer is looking for. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, and um, now talking about the consumer experience, uh, in the last two weeks, we had a number of questions about Modus. It's a, a startup in uh, Seattle. Uh, Modus is a software for title companies. Uh, Compass has acquired it uh, to potentially finally work on end-to-end -end online closing and to bring this transparency of what's going on in title and escrow process. And as you know from our many conversations with you ladies that we also are integrating with title software. We're also showing the transparency of the closing itself. Um, so the question, what do you think, what it means Compass acquiring models? And uh, have you heard the other broker owners to be worried about that and uh, how, how the news was perceived in the industry? Uh, Nina? Go ahead, Nina. Uh, yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> look, I think that this is a, it, it's a first step in a long process for a lot of companies. 
right, to um, partner with other companies, to acquire companies for data. Um, Fidelity uh, Investments has been doing it for a number of years, right? Um, I, I think, you know, the some of the most richest companies in the world uh, are, you know, data companies. So, you know, with that being said, I, I do think that, you know, um, while there's a concern for this data to be bought, I do think that, you know, this is, this is kind of a race to who, get, who gets to the finish line and who has the most information to be able to leverage. I mean, then you get into like talking about AI and if you have the more data points you have, the, you know, the faster, smarter. Um, so, I mean, Natalia, I'm speaking to the choir here, right, um, in that sense. So I, I, I think, is it a worry? Yes. I think from a consumer transparency perspective, like what does the consumer know about the data and where it's going? But I think if you were to say that any one company is going to be able to monopolize on an end-to-end -end piece, I think that that's a, it's really hard because there's so many roadblocks, right? as there are with like automated like e-closings, right? But to get everybody to the table to agree on a certain set of terms across the board is fundamentally really challenging. Um, and so I think, you know, while it's a concern of where data is being bought and sold, I don't necessarily think that that is a, um, you know, a red flag that's gonna go off in the everyday agent's mind because they're not really concerned about that piece, but it certainly should, uh, you know, be a cause for a conversation, I would say. Wouldn't you, Susie? That, definitely. And, you know, I think about Compass buying that company. Um, yes, it makes sense because title insurance is a huge moneymaker and, you know, sooner or later, Companies have to show a profit to their investors. Um, am I worried about it? No, because there's, you know, limited markets, compasses in limited markets. It's not everywhere. So they're not going to have an enormous data asset to sell because they're only in those certain geographies. Um, more, more on the brokerage owner side, I worry about the risk of that. You know, um, EXP has... Uh, an affiliation, but non, not owner, you know, we're, we don't own our title company. And from my board perspective, I would not suggest that a real estate company actually own its own title company. I get the wanting to own the end to end, but at the same time, there's, to me, there's too much liability in that. And again, I love Nina, what you're saying about the customer driving the conversation, the customer still should be offered, they must be offered the choice to choose and shop. And, you know, I myself am in the process right now and it's not transparent. I'm just doing a refinance on one of my properties and I'm asking multiple different title companies, what are the charges? Give me, an, give me a, you know, settlement statement, give me a settlement statement. And the numbers are all over the place. And not until, to Nina's point, not until that part becomes transparent too. This is what this charge is for. This is what I've, I've been in the business for going on 23 years. And I don't even know what these charges are about. So um, I'm not super concerned about Compass's um, acquisition. Yeah, I'm uh, mostly raising this question, not because of the data sharing, but actually about the uh, consumer experience, uh, because this is a tool for title companies that they acquired. Uh, and this is what, uh, it's similar to what Proppy is working on. So to your example, Susie, uh, what we're working on is to, when you close a transaction on our platform, uh, we would actually bring you, uh, provide you the transparency on the process. You would see what his closing attorney is doing, what, where the title or escrow process is today at, we would send reminders and so on. So I'm, I'm just um, questioning uh, whether you're hearing from the industry that Yes, broker owners or agents have to listen to what's going on in the market, to listen even to their own title companies. Are they becoming tech driven? Are they working with title companies that are open uh, to provide this transparency? If, so by, if by tech driven, you mean they can email a PDF? Okay. <laughs> At least that, right? I'm sorry. To the title companies out there, you know, no, I do think that there is. Um, there's a lot, a lot behind the curtain at the title company, even 
even for me, who's, you know, an industry expert, even for me. So I would love to see a little innovation in that area from a technology standpoint, just, just as to Nina's point, Zillow innovated on, you know, the, all, all the uh, information used to be behind the curtain in the MLS and Zillow, uh, um, you know, brought the customer into that experience too, so. And Susie, uh, you advise many, many bro broker owners, besides that you're affiliated with EXP also, you, you've been working with many brands in the industry across the country. Where do you think brokerages lose their money now uh, in terms when it comes to compliance and transaction? I was going to say um, real estate, you know, re they lose their money on their overhead. Um, well, you know, the reality from, from compliance standpoint, like, as I mentioned, I actually spoke to one of our compliance people. And even though we have a transaction management platform, there's all this manual inputting, manual checking, and the system doesn't move forward without someone clicking a button because it's just not, it's not, it still relies on a person to make sure that everything is done. And you and I have talked about Natalia in the past, how awesome it would be to start using AI to check, you know, the, the, the compliance person I spoke to said she had a checklist and she had a way that she reviewed contracts where she knew exactly where to look for the frequently asked mistakes basically mm -hmm. and um and so she would her eye would go to those spots you don't need to read everything well i th i think that there's an enormous opportunity um and it's going to take a little bit of building because i realize like for us in san francisco we have different contracts so you're going to have to build out a product that looks at the san francisco contract and then there's the, the car contracts but um and also have to pivot for when states or, or local municipalities make regulatory or policy changes, the, the contracts get updated, but still all in that, it requires people. And the more contracts, um, the agent that I spoke to said, we had 500, more than 500 deals going through just that her, her bin per month. And so imagine, you know, trying to scale your organization and having to hire people to do this in every one of your locations. It's just, you know, you're using the technology, but you're not fully automated. I would love to see a product that takes AI and just looks for those frequently, frequently mistaken problems, plus automatically pings the agent, not via email, via text, because I don't know about you guys, this gal in compliance said, and the agents don't read their emails. I'm like, guilty, guilty. Um, you know, a system that could text the agents that they're missing something. And it was all, and it should be all automated versus a live person having to do this. I don't, th does this exist, Natalia? I don't know. This is dream wish list We're for me. We're working on that for sure, but I don't want to get too much into profi. I more <laughs> want to hear your perspective on the, the way you think. That's my perspective. You know, a brokerage's number one, um, you know, overhead that cuts into their profit is obviously, you know, the real estate is one, but really it's, you know, salaries are the second. And if there's a technology solution, I'm not saying take people out of the equation, but there's a technology solution clearly versus all this m sort of manual, sort of digital solution. Mm -hmm. so. Got you. Nina, anything to add? So I, I think the only thing that I would add to that is that, you know, um, I think the biggest, you know, consumption of time, right, is based on risk management, right? Getting your agents to comply with the local rules, laws, disclosures, all of that. Um, and I think, you know, to take the human component out of that, there's something to be said about experience. And Susie, you're right, is that you can't have it be totally automated, right? There has to be somebody in there that's clicking that button. Um, and I think that, that that's good oversight. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, um, I think, time is the biggest factor here, right? Is what can you do in the limited time, amount of time that you have? And so really it's about the, the ease of use or allowing brokerages on the back end to be able to approve and manage the risk management side of this without it being, you know, every single doc. I have, I mean, I, I cannot tell you when you look at every single document for the same, you, you do have that, you know, <laughs> that list in your head where you're like, I'm going to do seven data points in the contract to look for, for errors, right? Because they're commonly, commonly made. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, obviously I would see, love to see, you know, something that um, were, were to create some ease of use for, for uh, not just the, 
you know, the brokerage side of things, but for the agent too, you know, they're having to input data over and over again into multiple, multiple systems. Um, and, you know, that, that gets frustrating for them. It's like, what, how many times do I have to type this address yeah. over and over and over again? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, this is exactly what uh, we're working on now, MLS integration. So we have automatically the address there, your listings, and then this allows you to start a transaction with one click, start an offer link with one click and so on, because the data is there. It's just a matter of a number of integrations. And I totally agree on, on in terms of the compliance uh, pieces. Uh, as, as far as I hear, there's today there is no platform, in your opinion, that actually can do um, compliance piece to detect signatures, to determine in one document uh, whether uh, there is missed information, the, the critical ones, everything is in the head of the coordinator. Yes, they do have checklists and the majority of tools have checklist capabilities. Uh, then the checklist often uh, can check whether those documents are in place. Uh, not all platforms have just few, but at least that it's already helping uh, because the system can hint, okay, out of your uh, 100 items on checklist, you have 80, 20 are still missing. But the next version uh, would be, okay, let's see how many documents don't have signatures. And it's not only just having access to the docu-signed or e-signed document, but also with the scanned document. Once you have a, a, a document that is scanned or just pictured by your phone, with today the uh, the software is uh, quite advanced to actually read it with OCR recognition and even detect whether there are signatures or not. So the technology is available. It's a matter of uh, who will connect the dots and which company will make it uh, important enough to put a priority uh, specifically on that to make um, the TC work better, the consumer um, uh, experience better and so on. So, um, yeah, I, I, just, I just have to say disclaimer for anyone in the audience who's a broker or an agent, not in California. The reason that we're so sort of, you know, grinding our teeth about this compliance is we do have, sometimes we have contracts that are a thousand pages long. And so I know I also sell in Pennsylvania, our contracts, it's, it's criminal how small they are. It's amazing. Um, you know, 30 pages total, that's your file. And, um, but so it is, you know, from a compliance standpoint, it's definitely heavier in California and other places, uh, attorney states, obviously they have attorneys looking over everything. So you're getting everything looked at three and four times, but it's definitely an, a need in the, in California market for all the paper we generate. And overall, even though we're, we're saying that the real estate industry has some digitalization uh, aspect already, uh, just we can uh, have a look at the history of the transaction involvement. Before, let's say 10, 20 years ago, uh, you would need only one agreement. And this is the case still in many other countries. You just have purchase agreement, right. no disclosures, no multiple forms. Thus, the agent was uh, just responsible to sign the agreement, close the transaction and receive the commission. Today, we have hundreds and hundreds of those forms. Thus, a TC profession evolved. Besides those uh, increased number of forms and disclaimers, uh, also in order to process the more complicated transaction, it's faster, but it became more complex. Besides that, uh, they now have to use about 20 different tools, including DocuSign, which is, again, it's helping, but more tools are being added and more forms to, uh, are added. And thus, really, uh, the compliance uh, automation should be more advanced on, on my opinion. And, and to your point, Natalia, as I said, I have agents in different parts of the country. And you know, if there was a place, if, if there was a place for all things to take place within one platform, it would be amazing. Just this morning, I had a gal from New York City say to me, Susie, if she's moving over to our company, I need to know where I find, a, she's listing a property for sale and New York City, you know, my, my forms come through my MLS, my association, right? I log into my association. I get my forms there. You're that's just, not, <laughs> that's not how it works everywhere. So yeah. it's, it's like you said, it's all disjointed and, and in, in New York city, they don't have an, 
association they're not required to belong to it and so they don't have a, a zip forms within there you know it's all just still still sort of not integrated the mm -hmm. other the other point that you reminded me from a broker owner standpoint if you're going to scale outside of your state you really want something that works everywhere and um I, you know and and then also internationally if your company is fast growing and you have an international presence you're you're going to want one <laughs> you don't want a bunch of dis disassembled pieces one platform that can do everything what i love about this all one platform in my dream world is also to be able to predict me as the agent i want to predict my income so there might be a piece in there that looks at the you know does the commission break out on my side and as the broker owner, I want to look what I have in the pipeline so I can, you know, forecast, see how, how am I hitting my numbers that we projected? How am I doing year over year? What do I need to do to pivot my business? Because, you know, our industry is so dynamic. You want those numbers at your fingertips. You don't want to wait till it comes out, you know, when Car Association does their economic report. I, I can't wait. I can't stay in business if I can't make predictions. And so this piece, this all in one platform would be a great spot to see what my revenue is going to look like too. Gotcha. I agree. And uh, Nina, um, uh, can you share which new topics you expect at the upcoming NAR policy meetings in November? Do you observe new discussions regarding digital transactions due to COVID-19 this year? Yeah, so uh, in terms of new topics, I mean, there hasn't really been much that's happened on the legislative side just because of COVID-19. But what I will say is that, you know, NAR is, you know, has, has been looking into automated transactions for um, quite some time. Um, and, you know, we're aware that, you know, they are becoming an industry norm. Um, and in, you know, recent legislation, uh, the National Association of Realtors um, lent its support to the Secure Notarization Act. And I'm not sure if, um, for those of you that are watching, it's securing and enabling commerce using remote and electronic notarization act of 2020. And basically that just provides a baseline for um, you know, recognition of um, you know, electronic signatures um, and e-closings. Um, and so you know, what we're really doing is trying to uh, facilitate uh, the ease of uh, the use of electronic signatures um, and e-closings and transaction automation is certainly a part of that piece. Yes. Uh, I think that, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. The um, Second Century Ventures is always looking at companies who, um, like Proppy, who is a... Yes, uh, we were a part of a, it. <laughs> you are a part of it. So um, I think, you know, this is something that uh, the National Association has you know, set their uh, sights on. I think that they're watching all of the legislation that's coming forward in, in this arena and certainly bringing that to the table for realtors. I think they understand, uh, you know, the need to be at the forefront of this. And I think that during COVID-19, this has been one of the pieces of legislation um, and most states have enacted kind of an emergency remote online notarization. But, you know, going forward, we realize that there, this is not the last and, you know, this is not the last situation that we're going to be in where we're going to need to be able to facilitate. Exactly. So really just kind of wanting, you know, I think not much very new in, in the terms of, you know, on the policy side, but just, you know, really kind of focusing on uh, those, uh, those pieces and trying to bring stakeholders together. And what I will say is that um, the National Association has uh, brought together uh, industry leaders to talk about this, to talk about what those baseline requirements would be for e-closing their automated transactions. Um, and I think the closer we get to uh, kind of a larger acceptance of what those baseline rules are, um, and more companies have to adopt this way of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. I think that one thing that we found uh, in, in this pandemic is that, you know, Agents are really adaptable and they are, they have made leaps and bounds. What we've done in a matter of seven or eight months uh, has been more than what we've done in the last 10 years in terms of agents accepting technology as a space to be able to fundamentally, you know, transition their business and utilize the technology to make their business, you know, work smarter, um, work smarter, not harder, right? Yeah. 
Fantastic. Thank you for updating about this act. Can you share a little bit more? What were the problems in remote notarization that provoked this act to be needed? So I think th this mainly comes around a lack of industry consensus, right, on what are the core components of a paperless transaction. So, you know, whether, you know, like Susie was saying earlier, you know, for a company to develop this in-house would be just insane, right? So whether you build or you buy a technology that, that is able to facilitate those core components. And then obviously, you know, it's all about regulation, right? You can't have 50 different states that have 50 different regulations. Um, and I think that that's kind of uh, the problem right now, right? With um, facilitating e-closing uh, is that, you know, there are certain title companies that can facilitate e-closings and then there are certain ones that can't. So if you are working within a platform that you know, um, you c you're only allowed to select certain pieces. I think this really has to be a, 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 a nationwide adoption of, of this technology for it to really take off and, and, and move in a way that really helps the consumer. And by um, national wide adoption, do you mean like enforcement recommendations by whom? So, I mean, I, I know that the National Association is, is, is working on this, but really I think that this is, you know, um, regulatory bodies, right? Um, we're going to need some judicial guidance on what, what those terms mean. Um, and I think, you know, the reason why this is, we're, we're at kind of this um, standstill is because there's a lack of defined standards or guidelines. Um, and I think that if there, there were more companies that had that, you know, here's the handbook of how to actually do this. Um, and each company is not creating their own set of guidelines within their own company, because that makes it incre incredibly challenging for the rest of, you know, um, not just title companies and lenders to follow suit, but, you know, for the, the, the platform to be able to adjust to all of those different regulations. So I think really it's that, that's what I mean by uh, an industry nationwide adoption is there has to be a uniform set of rules that apply across state boundaries because Susie, I'm sure you had this, you have this same similar situation where you have a client that's in Nevada that's trying to sell their home in California. And, you know, there's just no way for them to sign documents because they couldn't travel and they, there was no air travel. And so what happens, right? Um, so I think that, you know, the more we look at, at it facilitating that kind of, uh, of business at the transaction level, um, you know, it'll be easier for us to implement something. Great. Yeah, got you. Uh, we will be wrapping up soon. And so, uh, Susie, uh, what, what do you think about blockchain? And uh, you mentioned already AI, but we all know that you're a big fan of uh, blockchain. How do you think this technology uh, can influence the future of real estate transactions? Well, you know, Natalia, no one's talking about blockchain right now because, you know, it seems to be, uh, you know, it's, it's so new still that, um, you know, uh, everyone's looking for a different way to disrupt this, disrupt the industry. But I think how blockchain could easily, I mean, I'm stuck on this. I hope you're taking notes of what I want built. <laughs> I want not to ever take the agent out of the transaction, but I would love, you know, the utilization of blockchain with the ability to do the instant offer. And, you know, the agent still acts as a fiduciary and we can, we can see how technology has already made our, besides all the paper that we have to do now, it, you know, Zillow and these things that we used to be in charge of the search and handing the information over. Now the information is out to the customer. They, they literally can go onto the internet and kind of gauge what the property might be worth. So could there be blockchain you know, using, using the smart contract on blockchain to do an offer situation. Could the blockchain be where the whole transaction takes place? You know, we've talked about that before and that way there's a record of, of it and, and it's a permanent record. Um, I think blockchain as far as um, and in, using for commercial and investment mm -hmm. is, is already, you know, it's already in the works, right? That's already here. But from the residential, it's again, it's going to take on the back end people like Proppy to build something that on the front end will still feel like 
a normal user experience, but it's just souped up on the back end. That's why we don't talk about it, right? Because the consumer really doesn't understand it. And, and yeah, why, why, sh why should they? It's like talking to them about Linux or C plus or just Ruby on Rails. Doesn't, doesn't matter. doesn't matter what you use. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, very quickly, what's your take on, on potential downturn uh, in real estate next year? Oops, don't get me started. <laughs> so, uh, briefly, and then we'll go to recommendations okay. and your thought about the future. I, I, am, I am strongly believing that we are having a correction and you know we're, we can see it already. I can see it by the amount of properties coming on the market, especially in the Bay Area. Now, granted, San Francisco has a monoculture, Berkeley has a monoculture, meaning technology has such a technology in San Francisco and UC Berkeley in Berkeley. Um, you know, so I, when I moved to California six years ago, there were 500 houses in the entire San Francisco MLS for sale. The last I looked maybe about six days ago, there were almost 1500, 1500 condos for sale just in San Francisco. And so we, we're having a shift. Mm -hmm. Um, the rest of the country is still really experiencing, you know, multiple offer situation, but there's gonna be a cascade effect of these forbearances coming due. I've already talked to lenders who say their people didn't realize that the forbearance amount doesn't get tacked on the end of their mortgage. They have to come up with it as soon as they're out of forbearance and they're certainly not in that position. So stay tuned for 2021, you know, on the flip side, I'm an investor. So it will be good for things to cool down a little bit. I'm not talking global financial crisis. I'm talking about back to reality of where our, you know, where our economy really is right now. Nina? Yeah, so I mean, I would certainly agree with Susie on, on all those points, especially in terms of what's happening in the San Francisco market. But I think that one of the shifts that um, we should also take into account is um, the freedom that, uh, you know, um, workers now have to work from home. Um, and maybe not be coming back into an office environment for for some time. And I think so, you know, you may see hot pockets of people moving from one place to another. I mean, we're seeing that where people are wanting out of their high rise condo into something that has some outdoor space. So I think you're going to see that shift. But I also think, you know, interest rates are really low. Um, I think it, a lot is going to depend on the, co the confidence of, uh, you know, the consumer. Um, and that might all depend on what happens in, uh, you know, less than two weeks. So, um, you know, I'm hopeful, um, but um, I think, you know, those are some of the factors that, that I think we'll have to consider, but I still think that the market is strong and I think um, will continue to be um, for us, at least here in San Francisco. Great. Nina, uh, you are one of the change makers in our industry and your voice amplifies to encourage positive change. What do you think the next big change needed for our, our industry to thrive? Oh gosh, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I mean, obviously transaction automation is one of the big ones on the list, right? Just because uh, it does create uh, you know, a place for, for the consumer to have some transparency. But um, you know, I, I will say we've come leaps and bounds in terms of where we are uh, in the technology space. And I think one of the things that I'm really excited about is um, the adoption that the agents are um, utilizing for their own business. So I would say like, you know, there's not something that we, that I'm looking at that would say, oh my God, this is just going to change the real estate space. But I think that you know, we're seeing more and more adaptability within our own industry. And if we continue to, um, you know, build upon those, um, you know, fundamental baseline uh, factors, I think that, you know, our industry will remain strong. I think we just have to be open and adaptable. Fantastic. Susie? Oh, Nina's so positive. <laughs> um, I actually predict that our industry is going to consolidate from the agent side. There's um, already, because there are agents who will use technology to lead generate, to manage their transactions, to, you know, order a photographer, you never even go to the property. Um, because the commissions are going to shrink and they have been shrinking. Commissions are shrinking and we have a lot of disruptors in that space. 
So commissions will um, compress and the industry will consolidate because quite, quite frankly, there won't be enough to go around for everyone. And the agents who are mastering lead generation at, at scale are going to be the ones who dominate. So less players, more money. Fantastic. Um, so the final question will be, uh, what are your recommendations for broker owners and agents? Before we move to the final question, uh, after this session, uh, please stay online. We will show you new updates on the product uh, after we say goodbye to our guests. We will also talk and uh, illustrate our new uh, offer management, uh, which will be soon released uh, for free, free of charge for agents, as Proppy is launching soon, uh, Proppy offers 2.0 uh, with a new business model. So stay online here to look for the demo, to, which, uh, to watch the demo after the, uh, this final recommendations. Uh, the demo will not be uh, live streamed. So those of you who are watching us on Facebook, uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, and you want to be updated on Proppy Progress, sign up to our webinars and you'll uh, be able to watch our recordings. Uh, so uh, Nina and Susie, what are your top three recommendations for broker owners and agents? Susie, do you want to oh, go? Susie. Okay, oh, I, oh, me first. I'm having to think about it. Um, you know, the best way for broker owners to improve their margins, you know, the, the name of the game is growing your business. So, and to grow, um, you have to attract more agents. I think to um, shrink your overhead, and, you know, consider going, if you're still in the physical bricks and mortar location, shrink, shrink your, you know, now's a great time to renegotiate a lease unless you're the owner. Um, you know, shrink your footprint, expand your, expand your technology offerings and understanding they have, they have to adopt and adapt because this is really, you know, I have so many stories about people who didn't adapt and they've gone away in the business. So they've got to adapt and adopt technology and, um, you know, have, have a great offering for the agents, uh, for lead gen, because at the end of the day, that's what the agents want. They, they want a tool that helps them put money in their pocket. So that's my top three. Thank you, Susie. How about you, Nina? So for me, um, I, I mean, my advice would be obviously to look at all platforms, right? I think that when you're in that space of, you know, trying to figure out what, you know, what do I want to provide to uh, the agent? Um, and really, I think asking yourself that question is, does this product and it's, you know, vision for where it's going align with the values of the brokerage. And I think that, you know, more and more as we move towards, uh, you know, products, because this is, you're, we're seeing this all the time, right? Where companies are being bought by, you know, a bigger company. And, you know, I mean, contractually with one of them, right? So many agents were using contractually and then contractually is bought by Compass and then agents didn't want to use contractually. And so I think it's really, you know, looking at all of that and really aligning you know, the brokerage values with the, with the values of the product as well. So, um, you know, I mean, not so much in depth on, 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 on what Susie was saying, but, you know, certainly uh, I think that going forward, I think brokerages are going to have to ask themselves that question. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nina and Susie, for your insights today. Uh, that was a great, great discussion. Uh, looking forward to catching up with you soon. Uh, we will be doing a blog post about this conversation, posting it for all our readers. Thank you all. Uh, goodbye, Nina and Susie. And we will continue. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Susie. It was Thank great you. to do this it was with wonderful. you. And Natalia, awesome. Thank you so much.